we're so excited to have the Hogg Brothers here today for a special lunch edition of our talk. Um, Laura and Colin from Laura Reynolds Gallery, thank you for helping us organize this. They literally had a two hour slot that they could fit us in before they go to their MAG or Museum Art Design uh, Visionaries Award acceptance night. So congratulations to them. Um, and many of you are familiar with their whimsical, furry, gilded, colorful, bestial sculptures. And most recently, they had their Madonna installation at the Marianne Bosky Galleries that a lot of us shoppers went to. Um, but in any case, art, craft, materiality, design, you know, we completely drive with their process and their, their mad skills. The talented twins quite, have quite the creative background of being master stone carvers, painters, and also masterful with music, playing, writing, and singing. And in LA, their studio is ever growing. It sounds like they just are working to get a bigger space. Um, and as they collaborate and cross pollinate with architecture, fashion, film, music, art, and design. And so we are kind of in talks with working with them, which is really exciting for shop, and we're really, really excited to have them here. So please welcome me and join Simon and Ricky. We're so excited to be here. Um, you guys do amazing stuff, and I'm a huge fan of your work, so it's really cool for us to get to talk to you. Um, I think we're just going to run you through some of the stuff that we do. Um, Nikki and I started as furniture designers early on, but we also did a lot of like sets and props. Um, and I think our, our like love of materials and experimenting has led us into a realm of, I don't even know what it is, but we just make um, kind of strange sculptures and it's a mix of humor and uh, sort of a fantasy reality, and then really intensive material studies. Um, should I just launch into this yeah. slideshow? So this is, um, this is a, an example of some of our more material studies based work. These are made out of ceramic, uh, and they're built in layers using a pipette, uh, and we, we sort of, it's kind of like a 3D printing process, but done by hand. A lot of our work, a lot of our materials processes are kind of informed by how computers work, but they're done by hand. Uh, and so these are these are layer built, um, tiny beads of clay uh, are put on layer by layer onto a little ceramic egg, and each of the forms has a, a really simple kind of abstract rule of how they're built, some logic behind them, and I'll get into that a little more later. But um, we call these fairy bars or a version of kind of a Fabergé egg, uh, and they have no function at all, but they are coming out of uh, a history of, of making functional work and uh, a, a real love for, for the craft of ceramics. This is us. <laughs> <laughs> these are uh, some wooden stools, and he carved all of these by hand. Uh, I think it's a great example of the sort of cartoonish, um, what's that even called? It's like gestural work. And obviously, they're not the most, actually, they tip over really easily. They aren't so great to sit on, but they look great. And, and, <laughs> It's, we love having furniture that looks like it's going to walk off or that's, that you can have a relationship with. A lot of our work is about developing a relationship with the piece. Uh, and I think it's either about sort of having an emotional response to it or, um, or like a, how did they make that kind of a thing. And that's where um, we bounce back and forth between those two things. Can we talk about these there? Yeah. They're just like, I, I don't know, they're, they're sort of just like jokes. We've been really watching a lot of cartoons and so it was like, um, they're cartoon chairs, um, and they've got legs, so they're legs. <laughs> That's pretty simple. Uh, yeah. Oh, these are uh, these are rugs we made that are, uh, um, but they're all based on extinct animals. Uh, so it was like you could have like a fur rug of an extinct animal. It's not actually an extinct animal. Um, one of them is the. This is fruit stripe, which yeah. is like you know, remember fruit stripe gum. So fruit stripe. <laughs> so we bring in a lot of. Uh, like childhood 
a lot of childhood references, cartoons, and then um, the two of us loved Spencer's Gifts when we were kids, and also there are some things like Fruit Stripe Gum that just really stuck with us, and it's the only one on there that's not an extinct animal, it's just, um, it's just the Fruit Stripe Zebra. Uh, the, and the, the thylacine down there, it turns out it's not extinct, so we, but we did this one uh, when they said it was. <laughs>
octopus. It's like the octopus's garden on the inside. Yeah. Um, and it's all hand carved walnut. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no food, sorry. Yeah. Um, ah. Yeah, okay, so there's our, that's a, the mammoth rug, and then one of our uh, beasts, which I think is one of the things we're most well known for, um, those are our furry pieces of furniture with bronze legs, and those, we started making them because we were kind of interested in the uncanny valley, which is in robotics, I don't know if you know about it, but, but probably, in robotics, um, if a robot, if a humanoid robot gets too lifelike, it becomes really <coughs> creepy. Um, so you have to make it cute in order for it to be relatable. And I was thinking about that in terms of uh, taxidermy, because taxidermy is really creepy to me, but we grew up around it a lot in Texas. And um, we wanted to bring its fur in and make like cuter ones. So we never put faces on them, and it's more just about gesture. They're a little goofy. Uh, and the people who have them in their houses say hello to them in the morning and stuff. So the, what we wanted was to work, again, have a relationship with them. We don't for use fur anymore. Yeah, we've stopped using real fur, um, but we did for a long time use uh, mostly sheepskin. Uh, and then these two purple chairs here, uh, we call those the California raisins. And they, yeah, yeah, raisin death. Raisin, raisin death. And then uh, raisin Arizona. Raisin Arizona. Um, these have a, uh, the, the fabric on them is leather. I wanted to make a, um, I wanted to make like a prune texture. Uh, it's based it's, on a ball sack. It's, you always I, it. I, wanted to, I wanted to make a testable hammock. Somehow we've never done it, but uh, we will. Um, so, um, we, uh, we took a balloon and glued leather to it and then popped the balloon uh, so that it would shrink. Spray painted the balloon, then um, uh, delaminated the whole thing and found the, the right spots um, in the creases to, to sew onto a shrinking substrate in order to make a, a perfect prune. Um, so we have this prune. <laughs> 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 uh, so that's what, that's what that uh, material is. Um, but those were sort of a more classical kind of French uh, chair. It's a, it's I think unusually chair style chair for us. Um, I think like in Design Miami, we sort of ended up with like, like anytime we, any, any, we, we would we would purposely put stuff up in the fair that should not be there. It wasn't designed. It was very much like not functional things, and of course we got pushed back. But at the time we were like, what the fuck, man? We're just like putting stuff in. Why? And it was always French people that were like trying to get us out of the fair. So we're sort of like, let's make like the Frenchiest Frenchy chair that we can possibly <laughs> make. It's like the sort of like, you know, purple armchair that's like kind of small scale and tight and sweet, but it's ball sack that has like feet on it. <laughs> 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 uh, these are like our micro creeks are really small little, little animals. And so like with the fairy berries and with these are sort of like tests for us. We make a lot of these like little things so that you can, um, you know, like mock heads for large scale, it's like little experiments, and they're, they're all sort of portraits of friends or, or attitudes, like, they're all supposed to get something across, like, this is sort of like a shy guy, um, you know, this one's got a big wing, and then up close, whatever, but they're sort of like based on friends and, and personalities, so. Um, uh, this, is a, this is a large scale, uh, this is a large scale fountain we did in Miami, it's Casper Arms, that one before is, uh, Based on my godson, he's just catching water. This is my wife as a monkey. Uh, <laughs> and this is my friend Devendra, so he meditates a lot. So the idea is like there's water hitting him right in the face and he meditates through it. So. <laughs> That's the explanation. And then these are like our, these are actually functional to the same stone, they're like bent to become elephant benches. Um, as a kid, sort of, uh, we, we grew up like playing in fountains a lot, so we wanted to make a play fountain. Uh, when we had the opportunity to. Um, uh, this is a fireplace. It is also in the Zoidberg style. Uh, also, a uh, tea gray. Um, just more, oh my god, okay, this guy has the same, uh, the same vermiculated uh, fabric with the sense. 
in uh, velvet. He has a tongue that pulls out, and there's a pillow that pulls all the way out, and it's a, the most useless pillow of all time. <laughs> <laughs> you can, like put the pillow on the back of the eyes, and you can like lay down, but it's su of. super uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it also plugs in, and the eyeballs will glow. So it's another combo bench like fixture, but but not really a light like, fixture. And then we had a battery in the belly, and we had to ship this thing to Australia, and then we ended up with this like. Issue, you know, like how I don't know, at some point if you had like a helio phone or something on the plane, they'd make you like not take it on the plane. We had the same batteries in this thing, but anyways, we figured it out. It's a different battery now, but this is the same kind of series. These all light up, it's sparring lights up. Um, this one guy. Oh, so these three characters are based on Land Before Time. I don't know if you guys watched that, that movie. Um, so this is Littlefoot, uh, and then the other two were like Ducky and um, uh, Spike. So it's, it's like, again, we, we, we often just regurgitate childhood. I think like we had this, I had this moment for sure, where I was like, oh shit, we're in our 30s, like, our generation is sort of in charge of media. And, uh, um, like, it just felt like if you talk about Land Before Time, okay, we're all sort of in the same age, age range. We, it's a very, like, easy thing to point to where you go, I know Land Before Time. Or if it's someone much older or much younger, they have no idea what you're talking about. So, like, I just, I think we always really like that opportunity to be kind of like, oh hey, like, we understand each other at least a little bit, because we watched this like weird cartoon movie when we were kids. But, um, uh, do you want to talk about the trailer? Yeah. Uh, this is the Madonna, it's our, this is our Madonna. Um, <laughs> and this was just at Mary Bosky. I know some of you went and saw this. Um, the legs are in, uh, in marble, also from the same quarry. And the top is a combination of beadwork from South Africa and some beadwork from Central, uh, the Central Valley in California. So this has a long backstory. I'll try to make it quick, but we, we worked um, in South Africa for, we've been doing this for about six years, is that right? Seven years. Uh, we, we met a group of women in Cape Town who do beadwork, and they, they live in um, Kailicha and other townships surrounding Cape Town, uh, and they were all working through a, a not-for-profit that gives beads uh, to women in, in townships so that they can um, generate an income for themselves, basically. They make these little animals. Um, we met them and we, we love their work. We realized it takes just as much time as ours. It's really gorgeous stuff, um, but you can buy it for like 20 or $30, and we thought that that was really, really undervalued considering how long it takes to make these things. So we wanted to work with them, uh, and uh, we put them on salary, and there's a, we have profit sharing with them for all of the objects that they make. Um, but we, our first project together, we did a, a presentation at the Cooper Hewitt, and it was all these really insane uh, creatures, and similar to our beasts, uh, but just all in beads and with some color. So her, her body is in that style, and then the top is a crown that's made in Los Hills, California, which is a community that we've, uh, we've been invited into to develop a, a new craft uh, it's sort of an economic opportunity there. It's a farming, it's an unincorporated farming town uh, where there's basically no work for women. There's a, a gas station and like a Carl's Jr., but otherwise that's it. So uh, a friend of ours who owns a farm there uh, told us about that and asked us to come develop a, uh, a craft community. Uh, so now we actually have been full-time employing 26 women out there to do the work for us, which is kind of amazing. Uh, they also made this tree. These are made of basket weaving. It's parachute cord that is woven. It's a, a system of twining um, that's woven over uh, housing and copper wire. And then the flowers up here are beaded. Uh, same style as the crown on Madonna. This, this, this is like 15 feet tall. It's super it's hard to tell scale. So this process is very computer based. Uh, we don't use a computer to make it at all, but the beadwork and the weaving uh, is made using a system that I developed. It's an analog computing system where I, uh, I take a black bead and a white bead and I call the black bead zero and I call the white bead one and then I write formulas for them. So I wrote down a, an analog closed system that 
it's, I won't explain the whole thing, but basically it makes convergent shapes. Um, and uh, it's, it's very much tailored to uh, making plant life. It's got uh, building mechanisms, and it also has uh, programmed cell death. So there's, there's a building and a killing mechanism inside of this, um, inside of this uh, program. I don't really know how to describe it without showing you the whole graph of the thing. This is just a, a wrapping of the trunk, but here you can see uh, a close of the beads. Those are really simple helix shapes. I think there will be more of more interesting shapes. Uh, there's a big hand. This is also out of Kelly uh, de Tigre. The idea for this show was we started working with, uh, I mentioned South Africa, Los Hills, um, uh, also Marianne Boski, Laura Reynolds. Like we realized most of our work we do with women in general, and we wanted to sort of exalt them in this show. And this hand was um, was a, a male hand sinking with the ground. It was based on uh, kind of a, an image of ruins, like the all ruins where you see heads kind of tipped into the ground. And then once you go past this hand, there's a really like um, happy, joyous uh, plant world with crazy creatures inside. Uh, so here you can see. These are from Cape Town. These are, we call them Afriques, and they are just really wacky fantasy animals, and all of the plants from, were made in Lost Souls using that system I was talking about. Um, there's more shots of that. Oh wow, this is, oh, this is uh, a combination of ceramics and some more textile work. Um, also, those textile pieces have glass lampshades that are um, made using a layer built uh, glass process. It's lamp working. It was a precursor to the beadwork I was doing very much. Um, uh, they have a rule behind them. So, it's another kind of uh, analog computing system. Some more textile work with some beasts. There's the door up close. I know. Hands. Hands. <laughs> uh, this is at the Bath Museum. These are some of our earlier uh, Greeks. Uh, the bench there is the, the the three in the front are the first ones we made. That mushroom is interesting. So we, us coming up through the design world into the art world, um, that that mushroom is a great example of something that we had to do. Uh, we had to call uh, an umbrella. We Gave it a, we made it functional in name, but it's not actually functional because we were going to be kicked out of Design Miami for doing this show. Um, so we said, well, it's an umbrella, and then they let us stay. Um, <laughs> which is really silly, but we had to do that a lot early on. Um, you know, yes, yeah, it's just still a so. <laughs> They call it like, so Samurai did a lot of drugs when we were younger, we don't any longer. And it was like, uh, I heard about this drug called. Again in, in South Africa, and um, uh, so this is called an Iba Walker because the idea is like you get paralyzed from the waist down when you take it, and I, that gives you an idea of where our head was when we were making this stuff. It was like obviously the stupidest idea of all time. You go do that. I'm glad I never found it, but anyway, these are based on, these are based on, on it's called an Iba Walker because it's about Iba game, but um, saves time. More ceramics. Oh, these are the next yeah. Oh yeah. Well, so this is a this is the first ceramics process we ever did. This is based on caves. Um, it's also built in layers. I'm obsessed with the idea of how things pack themselves, and um, this is fully like a self packing of ceramics. Um, basically, what we do is brush really wet clay. It's called slip onto a vessel thousands of times. Um, bottom to top in the same direction with very careful pressure and the, the surface grows sort of like a cave. So uh, each of those little petals uh, has thousands of layers of clay and they all grow at the same time. A lot of people think we apply them after the fact, but, uh, but it's really a growth. So I love the idea that any choreographed action in building that is repeated over and over with the material will create a shape. 
Um, I think about when you walk up and down a uh, stone staircase for millennia and it starts to have a dip in it. It's kind of the same idea, except it's using material that can build quickly. Um, and this is additive rather than uh, reductive. But this was the first one of those sort of um, really intense process-based uh, and kind of programmatic uh, building processes that we have. And that has led into a lot of other things. Um, these are two candle holders and hands. Some more of those fairy berries. Um, so these I'll just say now that you've seen some of the bead work and the other ceramics. This is a, kind of a combination of our original ceramics and the bead work where we bring logic uh, from that bead system into our layer-based clay building. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not explaining it super clearly, but it's difficult to. Uh, more bees. Oh, we have a million images. <laughs> you guys want to ask some so questions? Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, yeah. Oh, so oh, that's so great. That's cool. You, you, you pull these, so the idea is that it's like zombie hands. You grab on the hand, you pull it out, and it's like a fork. So, <laughs> I think you guys get it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a Same people have really been working with us since we started hiring people, which is kind of cool. Um, and we have a, a, um, a we're, we're putting like a, a profit share in place for everything that works for us. It's like very much a, um, like that's what's cool about the studio. It's not just the two of us. It's um, it's it's all of us together creating online to like make the work. And uh, we really have like conversations with people on the floor. They say like our, our head ceramics guy is like. I don't think we should do it that way. We're like, okay, cool, which way should we do it? If he's right, then that's the way we're gonna do it, which is, which is great. Um, so it's really more of like a community. Simon and I are obviously like leading the charge. We started it and um, we come up with sort of like a future vision for it. Um, plus we do a lot of practical application as well and we're like working on all pieces together. But, but yeah, it's, it's a group of us, which is really cool. Then we have our families in South Africa and those hills. Um, and, and honestly, like, like I think of our, our studio that the, that the paintbrush of the studio is, is more of its like social engagement more so than, than the actual material. Like we use a lot of different materials as you guys can see. But like the money that we make the women in South Africa, the money we make the women in those hills, the, the money that the people inside of our studio make, um, is really the whole point of the whole thing. Like if we figured out that like the studio is gonna like go under or something like that. I wouldn't really be that bummed about the fact that we were going to make more work. I would just be like super bummed that there's like you know 40 people that work for us and don't have a job anymore. Plus like you know uh, 30 of those people don't really have a way to get any other job. You know, so which is which is sort of the whole point. Like we sent you know to the 15 women we have working in South Africa just last year we sent them like almost a million dollars, which they get to split between them. And before that they're making like two thousand dollars each year. So it's like, it's it's just like this awesome, beautiful thing that we get to do. So that's kind of like, we have this platform and this like ridiculous machine where we get to sell like an egg for $6,000. So it's like, like, it's sort of ridiculous. And then you kind of go, okay, sick, but then you get to like have other people share that with you. And then you go, okay, then there's like a point to it. And it feels like it's for real. And it's like, I don't know, it, it's, it's about the family. Like, um, I wouldn't want to have a, I think at first we were a little bit like embarrassed if we weren't like, Making every single piece completely from start to finish on our own, but I mean, look at you guys. I mean, this is there's a lot of people that work here. Like, this is a family too. I mean, you're making like you know buildings are like a mile high, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's different than just making like little eggs. But uh, but, uh, but but the point being, like, like that is the point of our studio. It's the point of the work. We didn't have a bunch of people working with us, and then um, like uh, I, w I would maybe do this with Simon. I, I don't think I would do it alone. But um, just the two of us, maybe. But but I just I don't think we get to say as much as we get to say. So it's more about it 
it, there's like momentum. That's why I like it. You know? so. hey, well, and one other question. Yeah. Which one's older? <laughs> Nine minutes older. No. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> So our dad was a stone carver in Austin, and we used to carve stone together all the time. When we were 14, we were doing that a whole bunch. But we also, um, we made little toys, and we, we went to a, a store called Toy Joy in Austin, and we tried to sell our toys there. Uh, and I said no. <laughs> but we tried. And we would do a lot of stop motion animation. Um, we made these um, uh, kind of obscene slippers called pussy puts that are um, vaginas that are put into um, I mean, when we were 12 years old, I remember <laughs> uh, our older brother was like, our older brother was 9 years old, those we were like 12 years old making pussy puts, he's like, so you know what it looks like. <laughs> 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 but anyways, we can cook with it. So we, we made a business out of that too. So we've actually always been making stuff together and then um, making a, a small business out of it. We were in a band was, together. Then we were in a band uh, called R R I I C C E E that was really bad. Um, yeah, that was not a name. Um, <laughs> what else did we make? I think that's kind of We built a treehouse. That was mostly you. But yeah, we, we've always been doing this. We made our mom an office in the back of the yard. an office. <laughs> Other questions? You mentioned the two projects, one or like you created a program for both branching and trimming, and then you had the other one where you kept applying slip and it became a creative over time. Do your programming efforts ever sort of define your process like that slip application or vice versa? Yeah, so the programming, um, those fairy berries are that kind of combination. Um, I I think even with just the slip application, if you say you you know, if you apply some rules like it must be done from bottom to top and then there's a certain amount of timing between them that's already kind of programmed. Um, definitely uh, definitely that sort of sparked something in my head that that repeat process thing is important. Um, the way the beat part came around and actually this is a, a pretty good example of it is I wanted to see how something could be grown in a scaled way as opposed to just those um, sort of tentacles on the ceramics getting longer, and the, the beads were my solution to that. Um, I had in my head, like, how do you create a sheet material that is the same shape when it's this size as when it's this size, because that's what leads to, and it's like the most mind-boggling question to me. Um, and so I thought, if I make beads or any other kind of material behave, like cells, uh, maybe I can make that happen. So I, I basically I allow the beads to split, meaning you can string up two beads instead of one when you're coming out of a bead. Um, and I allow them to delete, uh, so you, you just skip over, you don't string a bead on when you go into the next one. Um, and it's surprising how many shapes can come out of that. And there's uh, it's kind of endlessly fascinating to me. I've been working on this for um, about six years now, and I haven't beaded even a tiny fraction of all of the possibilities that there are. Um, but right now I'm focusing on making these really great. I can make a perfect torus now, which is, was a thing that I wanted to make for a long time, because it's a beautiful shape, and how do you do that? Um, but um, toruses and spirals, and it's really good at making horns, like a curly horn. Uh, and it's great for flowers, so I I'm excited because I get to just sort of write down a program that I think is going to make a shape, and then I will test it, and then if the shape pops out, and um, uh, and then I, if it doesn't work, I write another one down and try it again. But I should mention, the reason I started writing it this way is that we were working with uh, women who spoke Tosa, and I didn't speak that, and now I work with women who mostly speak Spanish, and I, I don't speak that. Either. So I wanted to make a, a system that wasn't, it's complicated in its inception, but it's actually not complicated to execute. Um, it requires an awareness of the of, of a moment, a 
It's like a moment by moment awareness, um, meaning all you have to know is what color bead your string is coming out of in order to know what to do next. So the way I teach it is I say tug on your string, what color is the bead, um, the bead that the string's coming out of? Uh, if it's red, put on a blue bead. If it's blue, put on a red and then a blue bead. And you follow that rule over and over, and then the shape just comes out. So um, it's kind of a, I think it's a pretty beautiful thing. But well, like, like the main beauty of it to me, I mean, it's like a beautiful mathematical system, but more so it's like the, the, these, these women can take it home, they can work from home, they can make money at home doing it, um, where they can like still be going to school or taking care of kids or like living your life completely where it's not, you know, it's like Instagram or something where you just like pick it up and do it. Um, but they're, they're like making money and they can support themselves and their families uh, through your work uh, at home so it's not disruptive to their life, which is, which is like the, the, the major beauty of it. Simon came up with that idea in South Africa before he created this system of like making things in parts and then assembling them later in our studio. Um, so all the plants are, they start as many, many different little parts that then get assembled by us in LA, um, which, which just allows like, you know, like 30 people to work on one sculpture uh, and they can all make a great living doing it without having to leave where they're from, which is, which is, that's the biggest beauty of it. And it's a simple system. So once they learn the system, they can, you can, you don't have to spend a lot of time communicating what it is they have to do. You can the formula and say this, you know, 600 times between the 20 of you. And then that's, that's, that's what's so cool about it to me. It's like really powerful. That was a long answer. It is. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's complicated. I could do yeah. the whole thing on how, does, how that works. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, how much of your work is through commission, and how much of it is exploration of something that you have in mind? Uh, it's mostly exploration of something that we have in mind. We're, we're really curious. We have a lot of ideas, and we're just constantly making stuff. Um, commissions, we love doing. If it's an exciting project or or it's an exciting partner, um, we you know, we never do like uh, someone's like hey I want to register like we won't do that. But if something cool comes to us uh, and it's an ex exciting thing, then we do that. Um, but yeah, mostly we are kind of self directed there. It's a time thing, man. It's like oh, we get to, we get to like we get to like make whatever the hell we want, and then love me enough we have like people. For us. So it's like if someone's like, I want this exact dimension and like this color, and like, can you change the feet to this material? It just starts to become this like conversation. And, like, I don't have time to like, <laughs> you're cool, I like talking to you about it. But, <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>